Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session, uh, which is called Financial Inclusion, Increasing the Pace. And I think the inspiration for this session actually came for those of you who were at Cybos three years ago and watched Bill Gates' opening keynote, where he talked about financial inclusion being the next big thing for the Gates uh, Foundation. And I think what we, what we want to try and encompass with actually a group of really very well qualified people on this table is to talk about how things have changed from then until now and what is going on with banking the unbanked. And, and I just want to make an observation because I was watching the earlier session on identity and identity is such a key part of inclusion um, that there's a great divide I feel between the developed world and the developing world which we were talking about where identity becomes a great enabler in the developing world and seems to be sort of an, in, an inhibitor in the, in, in the developed world, which uh, strikes me as an interesting sort of place to think about things. And if you think about financial inclusion, uh, whilst there's been significant progress towards financial inclusion, continued significant challenges remain. There are about 2 billion people around the world who don't even have a basic bank account. Some groups are significantly more excluded than others. We can think about women, the rural poor, people in remote areas that have little access to infrastructure. Almost 60% of adults without an account around the world cite the main reason they don't have an account is because they can't afford it, which is a very interesting psychological thought when you think about money. And there's also another statistic which I often use, which was done from a BCG study, that every 1% increase in financial inclusion actually results in a 3.6% increase in GDP growth. Good afternoon. My name is Christine Duhame. I'm the founder of the Digital Finance Institute. And I'm here to talk about, I guess, the toughest one of all, the AML issue. And I'm also a lawyer in AML law and private practice. So a uh, topic dear to my heart. So, so Christine, you, you were talking earlier, and you, you think that actually regulation uh, is not an enabler. It's actually quite the opposite. So talk us through why, why you sort of have taken that point of view, given Everything well, I just said. <laughs> I'll start off with an example. So I'm helping a, a Bitcoin exchange, a digital currency exchange that lists ICOs um, startup in Vancouver. And a lot of fintech companies got together to do this and they wanted to do it the right way. And the right way to them was, look, let's not get shut down. Let's, let's have AML as the first thing we do. So I started to map out what anti-money laundering law was with counterterrorism law, with sanctions law on a big chart for them. I kid you not, our chart is about as big as that wall. Um, but kind of list out, you know, if you're a corporation, these are the steps. If you have beneficial ownership, these are the next steps. If you're a person, these are the steps. And if you're, you know, on a terrorist list, then these steps. And, you know, people come in and they're like, holy cow, how, like, how do you onboard a client in a place like Canada, around the world, when that is the law that you're asking a fintech or you're asking, you know, a techie to kind of comprehend and, and comply with? So it is complex, it's expensive, and instead of enabling us to bring technology in to service clients online, we've created this incredible uh, legal infrastructure that makes it really, really difficult for the average person on the street to even get a bank account, including in our country. Um, so for me, the first step is, look, let, let's make it easier. Let's make it possible to onboard people online. Let's make it comprehensible. Let's, let's not, you know, make it so difficult that people can't get bank accounts. So, so I think there's a, there's a bit of a challenge here because while I think you can focus on the underbanked community uh, and at, do as India has done, which is essentially push past that sort of regulatory framework and say, we're going to do it our way. We're going to have a biometric one-size-fits-all solution. Mm -hmm. And that you can do really quickly with strong central leadership, as India has done very successfully. But in a place like um, South Africa and in a number of the countries in Africa, you've got these two economies that coexist in the one country. So you've got a developed economy, which has all of the complexity and therefore the need for active risk management of a Canada or a US or a UK. And you've got a large unbanked community. And so uh, the government has a real conceptual difficulty going, you know what, I'm just going to make those guys do that, but not make these guys do the same thing. So you've got that difficulty of reconciliation. And I don't, I'm not sure that there's a perfect answer to that. The root, root of all of this is back to identity, yeah. right? Yeah. So I mean, say you, you solve yeah. it yeah. with biometrics, so you solve it somehow, right? Sure, but you've, you've added another really important element there, which is the undocumented community, mm -hmm. the, the immigrants without papers. This is a big problem in a lot of developing economies. Mm -hmm. And there are political issues about giving rights and giving framework to, to those people, even though actually the logic of the economy is you just should. You should just give them the biometrics and be done with it, right? So, so maybe, Patrick, because you, you, you're operating in 
these rural communities, how do you deal with the issue of identity and, and well, yeah, so for, uh, for many of our products there, we, we are providing in consumer financing. And in those cases, we, um, we, we collect um, people's identity as best we can. But, you know, I think we're, um, you know, we don't have as stringent of standards as a lot of companies might have, you know, in the, in the global West, um, you know, to, uh, to get people's identity. I mean, and oftentimes we're selling products to, uh, to people in a, in a market visit where, you know, their ID might be miles away and they don't have a transportation mechanism to get back and forth or they don't even have identification. Um, so one way that people are able to uh, be identified now is, um, you know, through their mobile money accounts. Uh, and that's, that's one way that we have a touch point with the consumer. But it is, um, it is a very different world. So, um, first of all, why is there two billion people that are unbanked today? Uh, there are essentially two issues. One is that they are out of reach of these points that uh, Uday mentioned, ATMs, uh, bank branches, or they don't have access to the internet. So they are out of reach of the traditional uh, banking touch points. Problem number two is that obviously this segment of the population is not well served by the banks, the traditional banks who actually never engineer their products and services to be adapted for, for these. It's not enough to provide financial services for the poor. Yeah. It actually needs to be integrated into the broader economy. We need to bring those two economies I was talking about yeah. together yeah. and interoperability is the key. Now, Technology is a big part of that, and, yep. and the open source software is a, is a great contribution, but it's actually a governance challenge. It's, a, it's actually a, about how you get all those different business interests. Telcos, retailers are very big in Africa in terms of money transfer, uh, banks, uh, and then the central banks and the governments, how you get them to come up with a common sort of framework for doing that interoperability. Uh, the traditional idea of African banks serving the, uh, the banked part of the community and kind of leaving the rest alone, uh, with, the, with the pressure of having to interoperate to, to be open loop with mobile solutions uh, and with new entrants is going to force those models to change quite rapidly as well. And so that you, you start to get that, that sense of interaction. Uh, I think that is probably the most exciting thing that can happen in Africa right now. And we're, remember, we're talking about whole of Africa, 55 jurisdictions, 1.2 billion people, you know, a great deal of complexity. Um, and just in my little world of payments, the stuff I wake up every morning thinking about, I know everyone else doesn't, so apologies, you know, but uh, I'm a payments geek. So um, if you think about the three biggest economies in Africa, you've got uh, Uga uh, sorry, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa, they all use a different form of a real-time convenient payment. One's card, one's electronic, and one's telco-based. Right, so that's actually quite a big challenge. How are you going to interoperate yeah. across a jurisdiction like that? So I guess, you know, to start with, it's, it's interesting that this problem of access to energy, uh, lack of access to energy, really goes hand in hand with the problem of lack of access to finance. So um, these problems go hand in hand, and, and we started working on providing um, off-grid energy solutions back in 2008, 2009. Uh, and the f I think there are kind of three things that you need to solve this problem. The first one was the products, just the hardware. Um, so thankfully, solar technology and battery technology has been improving to the point where now we can not only provide uh, a solar-powered light or solar-powered home system that's more affor affordable than kerosene, it's actually more affordable than the electrical grid. Um, so you know, even if you have a power line running right by your house, it's typically you know, a few hundred to a thousand dollars in, say, rural Kenya to get connected to that power line. And then you've got to deal with maintenance, you've got to deal with, in some cases, corruption. Um, so you know, we can now, for a couple hundred bucks, provide a solar home system that powers all of the small scale appliances that people demand in rural areas. Uh, you know, so all that energy forever, uh, or essentially forever, um, at a lower cost than just getting connected to the grid. Um, so the products were the first part of the challenge, and then the second thing is distribution. You know, th we found ourselves having to build all kinds of infrastructure, not just, you know, for the hardware, but to get these products to market, to explain them to people, to provide the after-sales service um, in rural areas that just wasn't available. Um, but then the third component of it turned out to be financing. So, you know, even if you have, the, have a great product and explain it to the consumer and you have a support system for it, um, the fact is, a solar-powered energy alternative is, has a higher upfront cost than a day's worth of kerosene or candles. 
So we had to figure out a way to solve that problem. And until just a few years ago, um, the only way to do it was with traditional you know, finance, so, you know, or, or slightly you know, non-traditional finance, like microfinance uh, products um, that you know, are just not available to everyone, unfortunately. Um, but now, with, uh, with the growth of mobile money, um, we have this, this new mechanism that's allowing this to really take off in a big way. And we can collect payments over time. Uh, and we can you know, build, a, build a, a history with, with clients uh, to understand whether, you know, when they're able to pay. Um, and uh, it's, it's solving the problem globally. So we've, we've lit up the lives of over 25 million people so far uh, with Sun King products. And we're planning to um, not stop until we get to all billion who need these products. It's actually mobile money and real-time payments, right? So yep. it's, it's not just having, it's the ability to yep. move the money to you as, and, and like you become basically the first touch point for these people of, of a financial service exactly. that brings them in. And we were talking, it's, you know, this is the idea of contextually based financial services. You know, we don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, it's a good day to open a bank account. Or it's a good day to get a loan. You know, we think about, I bought a car, so I need car insurance, or I bought a car and I need financing. So I get a solar panel, I need to finance it. So I need all the infrastructure around it, which is mobile money, moving the money around. And then you can build credit behind that. And you know, we were talking about other ways of getting credit in these markets, and that's how you build your credit history in a place that doesn't have credit. So, so most of these are unbanked consumers, and you know, oftentimes this is the first financial product that they're getting access to. Um, and so, yeah, we're looking at going. You know, of course, after people um, pay off their their solar home system, we can offer um, additional products, whether they're um, pay-as-you-go enabled or not. So. The thing with the solar products is, uh, if if uh, the security element of it is that if people don't make a payment, the product turns off. So it's a it's a way of providing sort of a semi asset backed uh, type of um, financial product, um, and and having you know the sort of automated ability to you know control access to the product if if people stop paying. Um, but after people pay off the product, we can you know, we can offer a range of products and services using that same um, pay-as-you-go capability. Um, so yeah, we're we're looking at a range of products, and it's interesting how in some of the frontier areas, um, you know, the demand for solar energy products, like you said, is actually driving the demand for mobile money for real-time exactly. payments now, and um, the interplay between yep. these is really interesting. Yep. Mm -hmm. So then maybe over to Chris. I mean, how do you? How do you think about this? How do we, we build, will we, we build this out? And yeah, talk us, talk us a bit about what you're doing. Okay, so, so um, let's, let's start with the sort of real world example um, uh, of the kind of stuff that can be done. What, what you're seeing on the screen right now is a series of grabs from a, a very successful financial inclusion payment program from South Africa. So about three or four years ago, uh, the government decided to automate the distribution of social welfare grants. And in, in South Africa, they're a big deal, right? Something like 17 million people eat because they get paid by the government each month. Uh, and and uh, without that money, uh, there would be serious uh, uh, lack of food. There would be serious problems. So it's a, it's a terribly important part of the economy. And um, starting with a card-based program, progressively, um, uh, all of those social grants have been uh, automated. Now that's a really big step forward. We've taken the, the banking rate in South Africa from 59% to about 77% through just through the introduction of this, of this program. And yet, it's not enough because the way this has ended up working is uh, each grant holder now has their, their card and uh, at Banks of Africa, we, uh, one of the things we do is run the ATM network in South Africa. So what we see every month on the first of the month when everybody gets their grant is this enormous spike in ATM payments, right? So what's happening is they're taking the, the card to the ATM and taking out the entire uh, grant in cash and then doing what they used to do with the cash. So they're not getting the full benefit of the financial inclusion potential of the card. The card is a full function item. You can walk into a, 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 a shop and pay using it, except that typically where the grant recipients are living, you're going to struggle to find a shop that will take a card. Right? So there's a, there's a first challenge. The, the, the second challenge I think here is that um, the literacy, the, the protection elements that Uday was talking about are not really there with this program, right? The people are, have worked out how to get hold of their grants, but they're not really, I think, being given the opportunity to use the full potential of the thing 
because of the education challenges of, of, of rolling that out. So um, while I don't want to take anything away from the program, I think it's been incredibly successful, we need to now do what we were talking about before, which is the next step of how do we integrate that back into the broader economy. Where the developing countries have made great strides in, in attacking the financial inclusion problem is being to take out the f biggest point of friction, which is moving money around. Because if you can create electronic money and you can move money from A to B to C at almost zero cost or zero cost, you pretty much solve the financial inclusion problem because then you build a in whole infrastructure on top of it. Now, I will also say that there is an entire gigantic flaw here at Cybos whose entire business model is about creating friction around payments and making money off those payments. Hey, and hey. that's where the developing market... <laughs> Taking advantage of friction, I'll allow that. <laughs> creating friction. <laughs> Taking advantage of friction. Thank you, Chris. And also, I think it's worth pointing out that we never talk about financial inclusion for businesses, which is also an issue. And when you talk about blockchain and ICOs, like the next biggest thing that's in the news every single day, those digital currency exchanges... Um, often cannot get bank accounts. And so here they are with the opportunity of providing a whole group of people all over the world with a, a way to move money that takes them completely outside the banking system. But those companies that support that can't get bank accounts. And unless those underlying entities can get bank accounts, none of the one billion people you're trying to give uh, financial services to can be assisted. So, on, so we do definitely need the banks on board to help us move with new financial technology or the whole thing just won't really go anywhere.